Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Vladimir Lenin once said, there are decades where nothing happens and weeks where decades happen. I was on a call uh, in May of 2020, about two years ago now, with a chief market strategist for one of the large global wealth management firms. And at the time, he was providing some economic insight and analysis as to what was going on. And this is a guy who I'd always made a point to listen to. Uh, he always seemed like he had logical and kind of a clear-headed approach to things and uh, oftentimes seemed like a, a beacon of light in a sea of chaos. Uh, but this particular call struck me because he began making statements and analysis that was just completely incongruous with what was going on at the time. I mean, I'm a natural contrarian by heart, but uh, what he was saying just did not fit the moment. Now, you may remember May of 2020, the lockdowns that were supposed to have been temporary were now becoming permanent. Professional sports leagues had suspended all their schedules. Um, <clears throat> the uh, stock market, the S&P 500, had dropped and was actually beginning a recovery at that point, but had dropped over 30% from uh, February to March when the pandemic really became uh, widespread. And so there was a lot of uncertainty at the time. Uh, supply chains were getting shut down. And so for him to make recommendations that he was, which was to, that China represented an opportunity at that moment, it, it, it just didn't fit. And so uh, I began to question uh, not only this individual, but it opened up, sort of put a light bulb on in my head, and I began to start to dig in. And what I began to realize was that I could no longer trust these large wealth management firms to provide objective financial analysis. Uh, everything that they were promoting was product-oriented. And so it began a, a journey for me, which was to start finding voices that didn't, uh, weren't biased that weren't uh, geared towards pushing a particular product at a particular time, uh, analysts who uh, weren't concerned about saying the wrong thing and potentially jeopardizing future streams of revenue. And that search led me to Alex Craner, who was in the first podcast uh, of this uh, of Upthinking Finance, and it led me to uh, the individual that we're going to be talking to today. His name is Russell Napier, and he's the author of the fortnightly published The Solid Ground Newsletter. He began writing his Solid Ground Global Macro Strategy Report in 1995 for an organization called CLSA, which is a capital markets and investment group based in Hong Kong. He forecast what was to become the Asian economic crisis and was voted Asia's number one equity strategist in all of the leading polls at that time. These forecasts that he wrote were compiled in a book he published last summer entitled The Asian Financial Crisis of 1995 to 1998, The Birth of the Age of Debt. And this is the book and the subject of my interview today with Mr. Napier. From 1999 to 2014, Russell continued writing and publishing as a consultant for CLSA. Russell Napier is as much a financial historian as, he, as an economist, and his work features lessons from financial history with a particular focus on the trends in money and credit. He published his first book in 2006 entitled Anatomy of the Bear, which forecast a major correction for the U.S. stock market, and then later wrote a report in the first quarter of 2009 called Finding the Bottom, where he cor correctly forecast that the bottom had occurred. For the first, past few years, his work has focused on growing evidence that the world is living through a breakdown in the global monetary system, and he has advised clients to invest for such an outcome rather than invest as if we are all living in just another business cycle expansion. And that is exactly why I have subscribed to the Solid Ground newsletter and why I value his views, because he isn't afraid to uh, take a stand and go in a different direction, which we'll be talking about in a moment as well. Um, additionally, Russell is the director of Orlock Advisors Limited, which is based at Edinburgh, Scotland. He's also the keeper of the Library of Mistakes, which is equally based in uh, Edinburgh. Now, the library mistakes uh, exist to allow students, professionals, and members of the general public to study financial history in order to understand how finances actually worked rather than how it should work if key unrealistic assumptions are made. For anybody who's interested, the library mistakes is, and its related podcast series are available online and can both be accessed at thelibraryofmistakes.com. 
It's my pleasure today to welcome live from Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, Professor Russell Napier. Russell, thank you, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Emerson. So we're going to be talking about your book, which, as you can see, for anybody who's actually watching, I've pretty much destroyed, and I'm not even quite all the way through it yet, but it's been more of a study than it has just been simply reading a book. And um, to set this up, Russell, I found that there's a lot of layers to this, at least for me. You, you chronologically go through the events of the Asian financial crisis, uh, in great detail, in a way that actually anybody that's reading can see this building problem. Um, you also give insights into the role that the financial services industry has in really kind of creating a snowball that gets bigger and bigger as time goes on. And then I think the other thing, too, that I wasn't expecting was these what I'll call sidebars, where you, you'll go off on certain subjects that may seem, you know, you devoted a page to the your presentation to the French Senate, which I'm going to get back to when it came to uh, your views on the euro. But there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of really interesting content here. Um, but the thing I wanted to start with is this idea of you going back and dissecting your own analysis from that period of time. And I'm just curious as to what the inspiration was uh, in writing this book and approaching it from that angle. Yeah, so the inspiration is not that dissimilar to my first book, and when I went back then and looked at the bottoms of four bear markets and I looked at the contemporaneous opinion, what people were saying about the future in 1921, 1932, 1949 and 1982, because I think that's a rich vein of research and understanding and it's not really done very much. Uh, in fact, it's not really done at all. So I decided to, uh, to, to do that because when people look at the future, and get it wrong. And this is what happens at you know great crises. People are obviously wrong when they talk about the future. Maybe what we can discover and understand is that the way to tell what's going to happen next is uh, consistent errors in forecasting at great tops and at great bottoms. So having done that in the first book, I obviously find myself with quite a lot of material from my own career where I had been trying to make contemporaneous, or I had made contemporaneous forecasts about the future. So I went back to look at that, and the plan was actually to look at all 27 years of it, but I kind of got stuck in the first two. So uh, what, what was going to be a book covering 27 years covered in detail this one episode, and I'm very glad I did it because I think uh, a more detailed expose of what is a top and a bottom, of course my first book only dealt with bottoms, but this one deals with a significant top as well. Uh, I think it was worthwhile. So I got some things right, and you've read the book, Emerson, you'll know I've got some things wrong as well. But let's let's try and get more focus on these contemporaneous opinions and where they were wrong as perhaps a guide to help us all forecast markets in the future. Now, and I want to get to because the truth is, is I didn't see at least in, you maybe I'm biased, but I didn't see a lot of wrong in there from what you wrote. And one impression and one one theme that came out of it was you consistently seem like a John the Baptist, kind of the voice in the wilderness, you know, with um, the analysis that you were providing, you referred to in the book about the crowd and how not everybody was always too happy to hear what you had to say, if that's my words. And then, um, again, I got to go back to that that meeting with the French Senate. I thought that was just such an interesting little snippet that took up about a page of your book. But when you went in and effectively laid out uh, the consequences of it, it, you know, a, a European, uh, you know, one currency that we're, I mean, you're living in it today where you are and we're watching it. So I, I'm just curious, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what it was like to be the guy that was sort of going against the grain. Yeah. So I'll divide that into two bits. And uh, the first bit is, remember, this wasn't just an economic expansion that I arrived into. This was a miracle. It was called the Asian Economic Miracle. It was referred to by everybody as the Asian Economic Miracle. There were books about the Asian Economic Miracle. So it wasn't just about growth. It wasn't just about a normal cycle. Something truly unique was supposed to be to be happening here. So when you said that it wasn't, that was a big. That was a very big thing. Uh, and of course, I was very young at the time, Emerson, as well, which didn't help to be uh, to be so young and inexperienced and coming in. But there is a parallel there, isn't there? It comes from Hans Christian Andersen, and uh, sometimes you have to be young and a bit naive to to point this out. So all all I was pointing out was really very simple. The uh, the reason there was a, a huge economic boom was because of the managed exchange rate regimes. And if you create one of those and run a huge external surplus, you basically guaranteed an economic boom with far too much money, far too much credit and rapidly rising asset prices. But the market didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear that this was somehow a fundamental story about a fundamentally different type of place 
with Asian values and investment. And it wasn't a monetary aberration. It was some sort of unique Asian way of of growing. So uh, obviously to be told that it's a, a monetary figment is not something that people want to hear. And frankly, everybody gets paid for believing the reverse. That's the problem. I mean, when a market is going up, just about everybody's getting paid to believe that it can continue to go up. So it's not a popular opinion to have, particularly if you work for a stockbroking company where you're getting paid by people giving you orders and nine out of 10 orders were buy orders and to write, write research suggesting that we would only take the sell orders was rather uh, rather unpopular. So uh, I've done that again you know, a few times since then. And uh, I don't know, I guess I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> Well, you know, you, um, you, and I've been, you and I actually, I, I started the company, my investment firm um, in 95. And so we have some kind of a longevity thing that's, it's a line, but you brought up a point which had never occurred to me. And it's kind of obvious in the book when you said that, you know, there's just from a purely profit standpoint, there's the buys making sell recommendations is going to be less profitable because there's going to be less of the population that owns whatever the sell recommendation is. Whereas if you're making buys, it's kind of an unlimited market. I mean, it's such a logical thing, but it just never really occurred to me. So um, you had mentioned in this, I would like you to put your professor hat on if you can and uh, explain, because I, I, I know I confided in you uh, in an email that understanding currency exchanges and that whole aspect of finance, it's just been one of those things either I don't have a really good attention span or it's just, it's, it's kind of complicated, but I thought you broke it down pretty well in the book, you know, at least the way I can understand, but could you explain that in, in kind of a simple terms for listeners to just understand, because that seemed to be the, the disguised I- issue in all this, this whole situation. Yeah, I think it's easier to, to understand these, easier to understand these days because, because people are familiar with quantitative easing. So think quantitative easing as I make the following explanation. Uh, Let's say I'm running the Hong Kong currency peg and my currency is linked at a set rate to the United States dollar. And I am the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and I wake up and there's lots of buy orders for my currency and that is going to push the exchange rate up and it's not allowed to go up. So I have to intervene in the stock market. So I intervene in the stock market and everybody knows that I therefore accumulate United States treasuries. And that's the asset side of my balance sheet. But what people don't focus is on the liability side of the balance sheet of this de facto central bank. So I've just created something. That's the, that's the key point here. This forces me to create something. Uh, if I'm going to buy, what do I buy all these treasuries with? It's with brand new, newly created Hong Kong money. Now, that's in the form of something called commercial bank reserves. But that's exactly what happens in, in QE that you're now very familiar with in the United States. The assets go up and the, and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the central bank's liabilities go up. And the idea is that the banks get all these freshly made commercial bank reserves and they begin lending money and you get, a, you get a, an economic boom. And that is what was happening in Asia. As you know, it didn't really happen during quantitative easing. Your banking system was not that aggressive in using this money. But certainly during this period, the Asian banking system was very aggressive. So just think of it as quantitative easing. The only difference is the asset accumulated by the Asian central bankers were treasuries and not their own bond market, but somebody else's bond market. But the bit that really counts, which is the liability side, was just like QE. And, And you know what impact that had on the U.S. stock market. Uh, well, in, in Asia, it affected the stock market and the banks actually lent the money. So you'd have got a double whammy. Some of these banks, banking systems were growing their assets by 30% per annum. Now, that's an unbelievable credit boom, but it was fueled by this uh, exchange rate policy, which is a monetary policy. And people forget that. That is the core of your monetary policy. And there's nothing they could do about it. There's nothing they could do to dampen it. They just had to go with it and accept it. And of course, if you're a politician, you love it. I mean, 30% credit growth, you know, 6% real growth. What's what's not to like? No one is going to step in and say this this can't continue. No one's going to take the punch bowl away because taking the punch bowl away would involve letting the currency revalue. So there was basically no incentive to do that. Or the voices that, you know, there were some technocrats in each of these countries who made the point that this had to be done. But no politician was going to do that. And, and remember, it's really important because that's a decision for a politician. It's not a decision for a central banker. You know, to move from a managed exchange rate to something else, you can't take that decision as a central banker. The politicians had to take it. And, the, and 
If, if central bankers are not very good at taking the punch bowl away when the party gets going, politicians will never take the punch bowl away when the party gets going. That sounds like the uh, the social security issue here in the U.S. that continues to just get pushed and pushed and pushed because nobody wants to be the bad guy. Um, so I want to go back to, again, you kind of being the the, the, the voice in the wilderness. And, um, you know, I know you mentioned in the book you worked for a firm that was that was a lot more open-minded and I think objective, I guess would be the word. Uh, but what kind of problems? Did you run into any problems? I mean, I know you went into a number of them in the book. Maybe anything you want to highlight as far as, you know, constantly trying to be true to what you were seeing? I mean, I know you had these obstacles like Bank of Thailand. I mean, but that was one of the stories. You know, how do you deal with, you found this research you were following, which I believe was the reserve, uh, you know, the, these reports that had the reserves every month. But then what? They started lying about their numbers. I mean, yeah. It sounds like a tough job. It's uh, well, you know, it's it's a tough job. But the worst that can happen is they can fire you. So as long as you don't mind getting fired, it's not actually no job is really tough if you don't mind getting fired. I didn't mind getting fired. The uh, so what people have got to understand is there are kind of two types of broken companies. There there are ones that do secondary research and there are ones that do primary business. And if you just broke secondary market stocks, then you have a bit more freedom. I wouldn't say you've got complete freedom, but you've got a bit more freedom to tell the truth. But most of our competitors were in the primary business and they were creating new securities, creating equities, creating bonds, creating convertibles. And then the pressure on you to, 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 to confer, confirm or conform to the economic miracle thesis is really very high. So I was quite lucky in that I was an organization that wasn't really dominated or had a very limited role to play in the primary issuance business. But I, I think this is why things have got so much worse. I mean, there's barely a stockbroker left on the planet who just does secondary market broking. Nearly everybody now has got this huge conflict of interest right at the very core of them. So I mentioned an earlier conflict, which is it's easier to write buy, buy notes than sell notes, but the primary issuance thing, so the, the, conflicts, uh, the conflicts are huge. Uh, you will just have to keep going until you get fired or get it right, and, and there is really no plan B. Also, the politicians will make noises to get you fired as well. So it's not just your own uh, internal people who will try and get you fired. The politicians will try and get you fired as well. Uh, and I had a little bit of that, but not so much of that. But I know some people who had you know, huge political problems and politicians demanding that their investment banks fire them. And some of them who've, who have been fired for writing notes that contradicted the wishes of governments. So this thing is deeply, deeply, deeply conflicted. And anybody who reads research from people like me or anybody else just has to understand the conflicts behind all of this. Uh, and I, I got lucky. I ended up in a firm where it was, it was actually founded and run by two journalists. So they loved the story amongst, above everything else, they loved a good story. And they were prepared to go to bat for anybody with a good story. And if I'd been in any other organization, I think I'd have been fired. I, a point came to my mind, a couple of them actually. You, you reminded me, Robert Kennedy is one of my personal heroes. And he always talked about the lack of moral courage, you know. And I think, to me, you strike me as somebody who's just really seeking for truth and understanding and try to communicate that. So, and this kind of gets to maybe the core of the book, but or at least the, perp, the the idea behind it, what you started with, which is the role of history. I mean, is that something that's always been kind of natural for you, this connection between going back to the past? I mean, is that just, or is that something that sort of came out of your 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 career as you evolved? Yeah, it, it came to me because I have no formal qualification in finance, economics, or uh, investment. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> So I ended up in this business as a lawyer, as a graduate trainee, knowing nothing about it. And then I was sent on courses on economics. And very quickly, I began to realize that they didn't bear any relationship to anything that I saw going on in the real world. My father was a butcher. I worked in a butcher shop. You know, butcher shop may be a very small scale economics, but it had nothing to do with these graphs I was looking at on these charts. So I had to educate myself very quickly. And financial history was just a simple way of doing it. And I thought, well, this is, first of all, it's much more interesting than graphs in the economic textbook. Actually, I think it's much more useful. It's much more practical. And more importantly than that, it's the real world. It's not a stylized world where all human beings are efficient. Uh, we have homo, homo economicus. And, uh, you know, I just did not see in the textbooks what I thought happened in real life, but it was everywhere in financial history. So, uh, and financial history is full of great stories. I mean, really interesting stories. So I find it much easier to educate myself uh, that way. And I've continued on that now for 33 years, and I've still got a lot to learn, but I you know, recommend anybody uh, who, even people who have the formal education in economics, finance, and, uh, and investment, 
read a lot more financial history, particularly at the, at the current moment, Emerson, where we are clearly putting a lot of politics back into markets uh, and geopolitics into markets, sociology into markets. Uh, and, you know, those textbooks I was given when I was uh, 25 or whatever, they'd stripped all of that out and thrown it away and expected me and everybody else to be able to understand economics without that stuff. So that's why I gravitated to financial financial history. I don't regret it. And just one final thing. Uh, it was I, I was very young when I read a, you know who James Grant is of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Jim wrote in a book once, uh, I think it was in Minding Mr. Market, he wrote the following, he said, in, in, in the physical sciences, knowledge is cumulative, but in finance, it is merely cyclical. And it occurred to me why. I, I mean, I kind of know why. It's because of, we have the wrong incentives. But there's not really a good reason why we don't learn the lessons of the past. So I've tried to do something about that. Well, and I started the open about how, because I was, I've been, you know, working over here. In fact, to tell you the truth, in, in in reading your book, I um, I don't know whether it was me just being so absorbed in starting my own firm because I had worked for a bank and you know quickly figured out that wasn't a way that wasn't a good way to, to, to work in this industry working for you know these big companies who have their as you said you know they pay out extra on their own products I mean it's just a lot of things that just aren't right for people um, but and I don't know if this is a fair observation but it seemed like. We were so absorbed here on this side of the Atlantic with the dot com era and everything. I honestly, Russell, I don't remember anything about anything I'm reading in your book other than long term capital management because it was a blip in the fourth quarter of you know nineteen ninety eight that got in the way of, you know, basically twenty plus returns every year. I mean, is that a fair observation? Yeah, I mean obviously I spent uh, I may have been based in Hong Kong then, but I spent a lot of time in America talking to American clients and I would go there in ninety six and say the Thai bat's going to devalue and they would go, where's Thailand? You know, that, that was kind of the reaction. Where's Thailand and why should I care? And it was a very difficult question to answer because, you know, it, it wasn't the Thailand that was important. It spread, but it, most importantly, it spread to Korea. Now, Korea, you really have to care about. I think then it was the fifth or sixth biggest exporting country in the world, even then. Uh, and when their currency went, suddenly the world was flooded with cheap products from Korea. And then very soon it bankrupted or played a role, a key role in bankrupting Russia. And that's a nuclear state. And suddenly Russia was in trouble. And then it got to Brazil. So uh, it was really only towards the tail end of that, as you say, it brought down LTCM, long-term uh, capital management. And only then I think that it really focused on the radar screens, but only very briefly because we got the response that we always got slash interest rates. So actually it played a huge role and not on the downside, but on the downside for that little wobble in September 1998, but because it sent a message to everybody in the markets. If something happens in the markets that is going to be bad for the American economy, Alan Greenspan will cut interest rates. There is a put. Now, some people would say there was a put from the day that Greenspan was put in place in 1987 because he cut interest rates when the market fell in October 87. But I think the real put was in uh, 1998. And I, I had the good fortune to know Paul Volcker a little bit. Uh, and I once asked him a very arrogant question. I said, you know, US monetary policy, where did it all go wrong? And he replied, L-T-C-M. So that, that, that little blip, yeah, I agree, it was a little blip. I didn't think it would be a little blip for the US economy. I thought it'd be more than that. But the reaction of Greenspan, I think, transformed the next 20 years. And there's lots in the book about other things that were transformed by the Asian crisis. But the response to LTCM, I think, just blew everybody uh, blew everybody away. Not that it was bailed out, because things get bailed out, but that the entire US monetary policy would be altered because one hedge fund was in trouble. That just, people were just shocked by that. And they got into, they did the only thing that they thought was appropriate, which was borrowed like crazy. And so, okay, and, and I'm going to ask you, because you, you're an objective guy, you know, I went, I've gone through and I really look for those mistakes because I know in the beginning of the book, you really made, you know, the point of this was to, you know, go back and critique your own analysis. And um, the only one that I really stood out, I don't know if it's a mistake, it's, if it's in less rather than more of a hindsight thing, but you, your, your expectation of the result of the, this Asian economic crisis was that leveraging would get cut back. You know, the, da the dangers would be seen, it would get reined in, and of course, exactly the opposites happened. Um, so are there any other maybe things that, you know, that you would share that perhaps I missed um, in there that would also perhaps you didn't see at the time, whether it was just a miss or perhaps hindsight? 
Yeah, so so I, I mean, I thought the Asian currencies would devalue, but what I didn't really focus on and came to far too late was the amount of foreign currency debt outstanding and just how much damage would be done by this. You know, if you'd asked me when Thailand devalued, how much would the US dollar value of Thai stocks go down? I don't know. I might have, I mean, I might have been really bearish and picked 50%, but they went down 90%. Uh, you know, the, the, pre, the president of Indonesia was swept away. Over a thousand people died in Indonesian riots. So the, magn, the direction may have been right, but the magnitude certainly wasn't. The next important thing was North Asia and particularly Korea. I would not have forecast that this could have, this could have res, resulted in the devaluation and near bankruptcy of Korea and that Taiwan would have to devalue. So I didn't see that coming either. But the fundamental mistake was to see this and say, this is a huge deflationary wave coming to the whole world. Uh, these currencies are cheap. They're going to export very cheaply. And secondly, many, many developed world banks are in big trouble here because they've lent all these dollars. And that is deflationary. Here is a deflationary pulse coming to the world, and that's bad for equity valuations. But it turned out to be incredibly positive for equity valuations, this great wave of deflation coming in. And those adjustments, you know, I remember when I was uh, starting this business, I think US rates were 6%. Uh, and I remember going into that recession of 1990 and just reading a little bit of report and saying, you know, never ever underestimate the power of a falling uh, Fed funds rate to rejuvenate growth. And uh, that was true. It was true in 1998. I mean, as you know, it's not so true today, given where the Fed funds rate got to, but it worked. And so that, that sort of focus on this deflation, and I forecast to be a collapse in capital expenditure. And I think that was right two years later, you know, so 1998, but there's a little surge in CapEx in America and growth associated with fiber. You've, we've now had a 20 year slump in CapEx. So I think that was right, but the timing was certainly wrong. And then the other thing going in behind that, which uh, you, know, you had to be very smart to get right, was the dot-com bubble. And there was a huge amount of enthusiasm carrying that along as well in, in America. And that another two years to run as well. So the deflationary impulse, well, something I should have learned because it happened later as well, that, that initial deflationary impulse, as long as it comes with growth in America, uh, is actually very positive for equities. You keep the discount rate low, the growth rate go, went up, not down as I'd expected, uh, and the market took two more years before it, uh, before the US market, before it peaked. One of the other things I like about your book is it, I mean, I'm reading it, and I'll, I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting to be as engaged as, as I was. Um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's really like, it's a story. But I think part of it is, is I feel like I'm reading, you know, this could be, you could have written this last week. And these could be, you know, I mean, there's just the parallels. I think that's what's really important and why I would, you know, recommend people get it. Because there's a lot to see. There's parallels. And you can, you kind of see these, uh, the kernels of all, a lot of the stuff we're dealing with today. Um and so I guess, you know, the birth of debt, you know, that's sort of the subtitle of the book. Is it simply just kind of what you said, that it's this idea that, you know, the government's going to come to the rescue? I mean, you mentioned that uh, in the beginning, I think, about these span the Mexican Tesbonos bonds. Is that Tesbonos? I think, am I getting that right? Yeah. And, and I just remember thinking, okay, well, this is at least one where that thread of the government will save us all. And I remember in the late 90s, I mean, it was it was actually pretty difficult being, you know, kind of a retail advisor because I'd have people come in and you talk about, you know, basic diversification and, you know, people, I mean, I had a guy say to me, you know, why would I put my money here when I can get 20% here as if this was just, you know, perpetual. And I think there's an element of that that still exists deep down in spite of, you know, the Great Recession and these things. And I'm just, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I think maybe you can tie it all together for me in a little bit of bow, this birth of debt idea. Yeah, so I also teach a course in finance. And we, we, we've got, I mean, we've got data on US returns really from 1800. So for everybody who's watching and listening, let, let me tell you a little secret. The long-term real return from US equities is 6.5% per annum. Uh, don't tell anybody, because as you say, most people think it's 20 and the difference between the six and a half and the 20% people think is the opportunity for salespeople. And uh, salespeople grab that opportunity with, with, with both hands. So often in a bull market, people believe the annual return is 20%, but it's six and a half. Six and a half real, by the way, makes you very rich with the joys of compounding. So it's not to be snubbed, but it's not 20%. Now, one way you could, how can, how can I get a return above six and a half? Uh, gear. Add debt. So with people believing in that, they have on the whole tried to put a little bit of gearing in to try and get that extra 
uh, extra thing. But it's not just about LTCM. It's not just about central bankers. The key thing that happened here was the monetary system that emerged from this crisis. So Paul Volcker used to call it the hybrid system. So Volcker was uh, responsible for, for building the post Bretton Woods system, but he left power in 87. Uh, and what happened is all these guys devalued and they all linked to other currencies, primarily the dollar. And the other currencies floated. There's no way anybody would have designed a system like that where some of them were linked and some of them floated. The consequence in terms of the age of debt is pretty straightforward. They, they exported deflation to the US, keeping interest rates low. Uh, they frightened central bankers to keep interest rates low. They bought lots of treasury bonds as well. And that freed up American savers to go and buy anything else. And they certainly did. So this all fed into a very lopsided global financial architecture, which really made it very cheap and very profitable uh, to borrow money, not just in America, primarily in America, but actually, actually anywhere. And the owners of assets were the huge beneficiaries of this lopsided, dangerous financial architecture. And I suppose the other place where I was wrong is it just ran much, much longer than I thought it would. I mean, it exploded spectacularly in 2007 to 2009, but was slightly resuscitated again because debt to GDP ratios have now reached an all time high. They're significantly above where they were uh, in 2007. So the longevity of the ability to use debt and keep using it and, and, and make profits from it was something that I did not foresee. I didn't think we'd be sitting here, you know, 24 years after the Asian financial crisis and debt to GDP ratio would still be going up. So there's this saying, you know, I mean, this isn't like brilliant wisdom, but this time, you know, the four most dangerous words in investing are this time it's different. And, you know, the idea being that, it, which is kind of contrary to what you, where you stand, I believe, and that is, you know, it, this is, it's just another part of the business cycle, um, you know, and, and I've had this conversation with clients and I've shown them these charts from, I mean, I started as a teller in the savings and loan industry in 1986 <laughs> and um, yeah, interest rates have gone down, gone down, 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 down. And, and risk mitigation has been simple. You just put more money in bonds. But I think again, you know, I got off one of your, your website, you know, that your view and I read that, you know, your, your newsletter, which is great um, because you clearly see that, you know, I, and if this is fair, that this time it is different. Um, that we've run out of, you know, I mean, that, I guess that's my question. I know I'm kind of all over the place here, but there's just so much is why people ignore this, why the preponderance of folks, I think, generally deep inside want to just continue to think that everything's going to go the same way. Um, I certainly know why people on my side of the desk, because all the all the uh, analysis I get on this side of the, the Atlantic is always product oriented. It's just another product, another product. Um, you know, and that's what I've appreciated about you is you don't come from that place. The book sort of lays it out, but where do you think, if it's not unfair to ask, where is this going to end? Because at some point, you know, you can't keep lowering rates. I mean, at some point, all this, it seems like it has to just come to a head. Yeah. So sometimes it is different because the structure of the system changes and the structure of the monetary system changes. I mean, the day that Paul Volcker was made chairman of the Federal Reserve, guess what? It was different. <laughs> I mean, it really was different. Uh, great time to buy bonds, for instance, and bonds had been known as certificates of confiscation up until that. But it doesn't happen very often. You know, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, and I would I would argue that the, the kind of history of our monetary systems is the gold standard ends, World War II, the Bretton Woods system, the Bretton Woods system ends. We go into kind of floating exchange rates, then China devalues. We go into this hybrid system, and now we're in a new system. And if you if you go back through that chronologically, kind of it changes every 30 years. That's, you know, it's not as accurate as that at all. But monetary systems, financial architectures last about 30 years and then they fall uh, fall apart. This one has, has fallen, up, fallen apart for the obvious reason that debt to GDP has got to such an astronomically high level that every time we have a recession, we look like we're teetering into a Great Depression. So the answer is, how has this monetary system changed this time? They tried to change it in 2009 with the launch of quantitative easing. I think that was a deliberate attempt to inflate away debts and for reasons we could go into, but maybe we shouldn't labour it, absolutely failed. So they've come up with a new way of doing that. And that this is a system that I call, well, is known as financial repression. And that's not dissimilar to the European way of destroying our debts after World War II. And so we get a, we get a rerun of that. But it's such a radically different system than the hybrid system that we've had since 94 or the floating system or even the Bretton Woods system. It's such a radically different system that we just have to learn new rules to, to cope with that. So for those people who say uh, it, it's uh, this this, uh, this time is different, is, is always dangerous. I use two words, Paul Volcker. <laughs> then my new response. Thank you for that. Um, 
so I guess in kind of just sort of wrapping this up, um, for people who would like to read this book, uh, what would you say to them as far as just helping get them up to speed and, and maybe opening their eyes to, because one of the other things that was in, in your, your content was it just seems like people don't want to see, you know, there's this, this constant uh, denial of, of either an honest opinion or just the reality of what's going on. I mean, like I said, I'm no currency, you know, expert, but when I read the part about uh, Thailand, Bank of Thailand, I think it was changing the currency that their securities are linked to. I mean, to me, that's like an obvious red flag that there's a problem. Um, so I guess maybe if, if you were to, if I were to ask you to humbly, you know, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what the benefit of, of reading your book, particularly today, because you published it last year, obviously, for a reason. I think you couldn't have picked a better time. Yeah, I mean, if, if there, are, there are a lot, I mean, obviously, I think there are lots of lessons in the book, but the one that I think is particularly current relates to China. So readers of the book, and I mentioned earlier that I didn't see this coming to North Asia, and Taiwan is in North Asia, and Taiwan had a large current account surplus, 3% of GDP, it had the third biggest foreign exchange reserves in, in Asia, which would have had it in the top 10 in the whole world. So it looked like a bit of a fortress. And we all woke up one morning in October 1997 that it devalued, and everybody was scratching their head. Uh, but it, those numbers are not dissimilar to China. China obviously has the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world, but its current account surplus is, is almost gone now. Hard to work out exactly where it is because of the um, you know the vagaries of, of COVID, but it's almost certainly gone. I think China's in a very similar situation to Taiwan, and we've got a capital exodus. Foreigners have liquidated quite a lot of uh, equities, but they're liquidating even more Chinese government bonds. The, the story on Bloomberg today is that the Chinese have stopped publishing the data on just how many bonds uh that foreigners are selling. I don't even know if that's true, but but it's quite an interesting, uh, you know, when you go back to the you know the central banks obfuscating the data, if indeed they've stopped doing that, it's not, never a, a very good sign. So when you have, if you don't run an external surplus on your managed exchange rate, which is where we were in Asia, and capital starts to leave, it tends to tighten monetary policy. And then the question is, how robust is the domestic system? If it's really robust, like the Hong Kong system turned out to be very robust. House prices collapsed, wages went down, banks were rock solid. Uh, but if it's not a robust system, if it's overgeared and interest rates go up and credit is less available, then you find yourself in trouble. Now, we already have that underway in China, particularly in the residential property market with some uh, fairly high profile uh, property developers defaulting on their on their debt. So I think you know there are lots of reasons to, to read the book. There's a nice cast of characters in there, of course. President Bush appears at one stage, one of the world's most famous cricketers is in there and a great footballer. And uh, so it's a little bit of a personal story. So I hope it's amusing in parts. But uh, it, it, for those who want to read it to try and sort of manage their money it just in the in the near term, I, I think it hopefully helps you ask the right questions about China. You still got to find the right answers. But that's the beautiful thing about financial history. Does it give you the right answers? Perhaps. Does it give you the right questions? Absolutely. And it gives you much better questions than you get from reading, uh, reading textbooks. I believe there was also a Michael Jaff Jackson reference in there, too, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Michael Jackson, that was an amazing uh, moment because capital was flowing into Korea. That was one of the reasons that I turned bullish in, in 1998. But one of the huge inflows of capital, I think, I mean, I can't remember what it was, but it was going to be Michael Jackson building a Neverland in Korea. And it turns out he was very friendly with the president. I think he was at the president's inauguration. And, and how he came to be friends with the president of South Korea, I've no idea. But anyway, that, that particular flood of capital to build uh, Neverland in South Korea, and that one never happened. Many, many other things did happen, but that, that particular one didn't happen. So Michael Jackson appeared as well. You have a great sense of humor, and it's, it actually is a fun read. And I think that's probably another thing I would have brought up in the beginning is just um, you really pull people in. It's not just kind of a documentary. It's it's really an experience that you went through. Um, you know, and even that moment with the uh, people in Argentina and their currency board, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just, you can see yourself, I could see you there, you know, dealing with these people who just don't want to hear what you have to say. And What was remarkable about that, and, and I was saying the, the currency board system wouldn't hold up. The currency board system did hold up for a few years, but those same people went through absolute hell to retain it. I mean, it was gross deflation, gross contraction. They were absolutely determined. And one has to kind of admire the determination, even though in the long run it didn't work, because everybody else was kind of blown away. But they stuck with it. And we never got to mention that that story on the 
on the European Union, you know, the, when I was talking to the French Senate when they came to Hong Kong to investigate this, my, my proposition to them is this crisis was a product of currency manipulation, that it, it allowed these imbalances to build up that we have discussed. And if they did the same thing in Europe, they would also build up these uh, debt and credit imbalances. There would be huge arbitrage opportunities. And of course, that's exactly what happened. That, you know, this was 1998. Uh, the currency wasn't launched for another year and a half from summer of 98. Uh, they built those up, they all unwound, and we had the European sovereign debt crisis. Uh, but they, they, as you know, the, the, the peculiar thing about the story is, as I was explaining that you know this would be a dangerous thing and it would create all sorts of havoc, uh, I, I also mentioned that making things more efficient, which is what the euro was supposed to do, may not be the most politically optimal outcome. I mean, people will be interested in that because making things efficient, you can also destroy people's culture in making them efficient. And I really didn't think that the French would be that happy all going to hypermarkets and destroying all of the little bakeries that you find splattered around uh, France. And anyway, when I finished that, I got a, there were 16 members of the Senate there. Two of them gave me a standing ovation, which was a bit of a surprise. But when I asked who the two were, it turned out to be the fascist and the communist. And my lesson from that was that if you put a euro in place in Europe, create all these imbalances and also play this role in demolishing something of the culture of Europe, nothing to do with the European Union, to do with a single currency. This was the, this was the next step that you would create, uh, not just economic crisis and credit crisis, but you would create political extremism. And now I, I guess people have lots of reasons why we have political extremism in Europe. But as of the first round of the French presidential election, 53% of the people voted extreme right and communist. And that doesn't get you into power in France because the president won. But I think it's a product of the single currency and no doubt many people disagree. And the single currency is still there. So it hasn't finished this wrecking ball of European society hasn't finished. So uh, that is not an anti-EU story, by the way. That is an anti-Euro story. And I think we can flip them at our peril and perhaps we can go back to something less dangerous in terms of a European Union without a Eurozone. But uh, this was one of the biggest mistakes, not just in monetary history, but in political and social history. And the consequences are still with us and they will get worse. Thanks for bringing that up because that caught me off guard and it just, it really showed how it's not just money, you know, and that's kind of the whole point of this podcast is connect people and relationships and the human side of, of how capitalism and, you know, just policies and things affect people. I don't know, any last words for people just on what you're doing, upcoming projects, the library of mistakes, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. So, I mean, I know the library of mistakes is in Edinburgh, but we're doing podcasts now and we're videoing our lectures and you can find those on, on YouTube. So you might enjoy those. You can always, our entire catalogs online. So you can just go in and say, put in the word inflation and then all the books with inflation and title will come up and you know, you can buy those online. Secondhand books and finance are very cheap, by the way, ever so the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> they're not expensive investments. So I recommend that you, uh, you, uh, you, do, you do that. And if anybody in America wants to open a library of mistakes, we, we will, we will, uh, we will help. I mean, I, I went, I did spend some time in Manhattan. I won't say who I was speaking to, but I was speaking to someone in Manhattan who may have the the means and the opportunity to open a library of mistakes. And I did a thirty minute pitch. Didn't he? Didn't say anything. And after I'd finished, he said. This is Manhattan. We don't do mistakes. <laughs> yeah, and therein lies the problem. Yeah, and and I, what could I say except uh, time to time to time to go somewhere else? Yeah. Well, I um I appreciate uh you know I found you through Alex Craner over in Monaco. I don't know if that name rings a bell, but he mm -hmm. he recommended a handful of people to follow as I was starting this journey to try to find people who weren't afraid to speak their mind and, and, and say what, how, what they're seeing, you know, not worry about future revenue streams from, you know, companies or countries. And, uh, you know, he led me to you and I, I will tell you, I appreciate the newsletter. I appreciate the candor. Um, it's refreshing to find somebody who's not afraid to just say, you know, get your money out of China. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't get that here, at least not with the big wealth firms anyway. And um, I've found that I'm just much better prepared in dealing with my clients and really, finding ways to properly position them for, you know, what's to come. Emerson, thank you. And just just on that, I mean, I mean, there's lots of advice you can get from lots of people. And, and I think the smartest guy in the markets is Charlie Munger. And of course, he's also a lawyer. Uh, and what I always say to anybody, and, and this will be true for all of your clients, is show me incentives and I'll show you outcomes. Munger says that. Uh, and whatever you're, whether, whether you're dealing with a local butcher or the local fund manager, ask yourself what their incentives are. 
and establish what their incentives are and understand those incentives and what that might lead them to do. And that's the same if you're investing in a company. And it is amazing that you can go through a whole business school education and nobody really under, nobody really sits you down and says, like, the most important thing is the incentive of the person you're dealing with. So we are in an industry that has, uh, you know, pretty poor incentives. So uh, it's important to seek out people with decent incentives. And, uh, and once you've taken that first step, the rest of it's actually... I think quite a bit, quite a bit easier. Well, I just appreciate you. Um, I feel like, you know, honestly, there was a time in my career where I, it was getting a little boring. It was sort of, you know, I had the kind of a blueprint that, that would work for most situations. And when you start actually digging in and really questioning things and looking at ideas that have been, um, you know, shelved or, or considered hocus pocus in terms of how to manage money for people, um, it, it becomes exciting, you know, and I think as difficult as it is now, just with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things that make no sense, it's really an exciting uh, time to be in this line of work, to be in this industry, I think. I mean, can you, can you imagine what it'd be like to be in a job where you walk into the office and know everything every day? No. I mean, it, it'd be, you know, <laughs> so I can't, because I've been doing this for 33 years, but the joy of coming to the office every day is I know I'm going to learn something. And I, you know, I, I teach. My job is to teach, but teachers should never say that they believe they know everything. So what a what a great job we have to you know it's scary and it may be a very difficult time for savers going forward, but we are learning all the time, and that's the good thing about it. Well, I appreciate your time, Russell. It's been a pleasure, and um, if I actually I want to let my any of my clients that are listening know um, I've got a few extra copies of of Russell's book. Um, and if you're interested, I'll be happy to send you a copy. So thanks again for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks very much. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.